And as entrepreneurs, our business is probably our most valuable asset. We know how to sell our homes. We know how to sell our cars, our stocks. No one's ever told you how to sell your seven, eight, nine figure thing that you own. He just acquired interest in it, added value to it, right? Instead of going from zero to one, he took it from one to two and then kicked it off to some guys who could take it from, from there. That's it. It's a game. So you got this concept and I've heard it before about being exit ready. If you're a brand looking at this, I want you to know you could sell your company. It has to work where it has to work. Welcome to Circle of Greatness. I'm your host, Nehemiah Davis. And today's show is about to be absolutely game changing. So you've been hearing people talk about buying businesses. You've been hearing people talk about selling businesses. Um, this might be the first guy that I've ever heard talk about buying a business. And the business that he was buying was 15 million. And this is probably seven, eight years ago when I didn't even know that was a thing. So I'm so excited to bring you guys my guy, Gamal. I mean, he's bought businesses, he sold businesses. He had this amazing company called Fresh Heritage that he recently exited, like a uh, social media guy. And also just somebody that gives me a lot of games. So without further ado, man, I'm excited to bring my brother Gamal on the stage. How you feeling, brother? What's up, bro? Thanks hey, for having me. Hey, thanks for being here, bro. So listen, bro, when I first heard about you, it was on Founder Magazine, bro. I remember. And you I was like 2016, 2017, probably. So it was about six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about buying a business for like you said 15 million? It was right under. It was like just, just under 14. It was like 13.8. But let me, before we go there, what made you talk about, what gave you the idea at that seven years ago? I'm talking about, I'm just getting in my entrepreneur stride, meaning I already was an entrepreneur for seven years. I feel like the biggest, and I don't want to go, go off, but for us, what if I started buying and selling businesses when I first started, like right. what gave you the idea seven years ago? And I'm sure if you you were trying to buy a 15 million dollar business, then I don't know if that was your first rodeo, but what jump right in I going big. Well, yeah. Talk about that, dog. Yeah. That's just different. And who exposed you to the idea of buying business? That's why I was about to go with it. Yeah. It's all about you can't want what you don't know. Yeah. So what happened to me was, you know, kid from Jamaica, came up here young, just hustled, parents working. So it came from nothing? Came from nothing, humble mm -hmm. beginnings. And um, <laughs> we just went to Jamaica, brought my two-year-old to Jamaica to see where I grew up. And my wife was like, man, y'all grew up poor. And I was like, no, we didn't. We had everything we needed, right? But starting from there to where we are now, I was at a networking event and saw some dude jumped out of a red drop top Ferrari, happened to be Jamaican, yeah. happened to have a lot in common. I'm like, dude, what do you do? I was in my late 20s, mid to late 20s. And he was like, oh, I'm in private equity. I buy and sell businesses. I'm like, I ain't never even heard about that. Mm. So that is like how you flip cars, flip real estate. You just do that with businesses. And as entrepreneurs, our business is probably our most valuable asset, right? We know how to sell our homes. We know how to sell our cars, our stocks. No one's ever told you how to sell your seven, eight, nine figure thing that you own. That's crazy. We just think we're supposed to build it, make money from it, and just walk away from it, pass it down to our kids. So he gave me two books to read, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun by Reginald Lewis. Yeah, I read that. And yeah. Barbarians at the Gate. And he, Dog, wait, hold on. Before you go, I read Why Should White Guys. And all he talked about was buying businesses, I felt like. Yep. The gist Him of it Peebles. is. Peebles was talking more on the yep. real estate stuff. Yep. The Damn. gist of it is it's a lot faster and easier, more predictable to buy something that's already established and to grow it. So instead of going from zero to one, go from one to two. And so I ain't never heard of that. And I was a black guy. So I'm like, where, where have I been? So anyways, I, I got the books and I tried to hurry up. What's the up second one? Just so I, I Barbarians at the gate. All right, bet. At the gate. At the gate. Yep. Right, cool. It was talking about leverage buyouts, raising money, buying companies, et cetera. And um, he told, I, I wanted to meet up with him for lunch. It was the most impressive guy I ever met. I researched him. He just sold his business to Dell for like 900 something million. Mm. I was like, God, please. And you were able to dude. grab a lunch with him. I was able to grab lunch with him. What was the formula to lunch with him? So that's the thing. I was just hounding him, right? <laughs> Their style is just <laughs> yeah, yeah, relentless, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I met up with him and then right off the rip, he quizzed me. He was like, what'd you think about this in the book? What'd you think about that? He wanted to make sure I wasn't going to waste his time. Mm. Lucky for him, I read both of them joints. Right. So action, right? right? So I read it and I had some feedback and obviously I was new, so I didn't know much, but he just wanted to know that he wasn't going to waste his time with me. And from that day forward, I spent the next two and a half years 
shadowing him, bro. Wow. Whenever I had an opportunity at lunch, I was just sitting in on his meetings. I traveled with him to Jamaica to do business deals. I, whenever I could, I was at his house, at his meeting, just a fly on the wall, learning as much as I could. For free. For free. Free. That's worth a quarter million to 500 a year. Right? Easily. In, in today's market, what somebody would charge for that. Easily. Yeah, maybe more. <laughs> Easily. And so I was light years ahead of my peers because while they was out clubbing, having fun, 5 p.m. when I got off the clock, right? hey, David, where you at? Oh, you're at Chops? Okay, Ben, I'm going to pull up. And you mind if I just sit in on your couple of meetings? I would literally spend four or five hours a day with him just chilling and learning, taking notes, going back to the car and just writing down what I learned. Yeah. So that's how I got exposed. You know, so crazy because I want, I want to dig a little deeper on that. But I want, Gamal, it's like I, I tell a lot of young men because, yeah, mainly only young men. Like they be like trying to figure out what it is. 18 year old, 17 year old, 19 year old. Like you need to go work for free for somebody. Like, that's all you need. Like, go find somebody that that you can learn from and go do whatever they tell you to do if they are successful. And for me, I tried that with multiple young men. And it's like they always want to chat. And there's nothing wrong. I don't like it's like one of the young men. I'm like, yeah, let's do this. And he asked my guy, like, is he paying? And I just was like, bro, I'm trying to get I, I should charge you to come. Right. <laughs> So it's I, like, it bothers me. I try to get these youngers. I'm like, yo, right now, the game for you is go learn up under somebody. If they willing to let you and just it, it, um, consume everything that they're saying and do it. That's the game. And I know you got to make money. So find a way to make money on the side. They may have opportunities, but go look to create an opportunity. 100%. Yeah. So that and not only the knowledge of it, but I borrowed his network. I was always the guy pulling up with them. So all of a sudden, partners at the biggest law firms, CEOs at banks, they took my calls now because they know David co-signed on me. But you can't even you can't even quantify what that is worth. Mm -mm. I didn't even think of. So that's the other thing. When people get in the rooms with just me, you, right? The terror. Like now, when, when you're in these rooms, you're immediate like, oh, yeah, I got you. Immediately, just because of the association that you can't even put a, a price tag on that, on association. Because one of the things I learned now, and I, I learned then and I, I know now, is that a lot of the opportunities is like who has been doing it. It's like the stuff that's not publicized or not going on social. It's like the sidebar conversations or the secret way to do things that not many people know, but you only learn through experience and failures. And so that was that. So I hung around him for a while. I saw, and so I worked with him for the, free. Is this the two years prior to you making the offer for that business? Yep. All right, yeah, so yeah. I did all of that, and then um, I would help him source the deals. So in buying, it's like, all right, you got to identify people who want to sell. Typically, it's people who are older, who want to go on and do something else, had a, a life-changing event or something like that, baby, whatever. They no longer want to hustle. And then connecting the people with money. In reality, there's way more people with money who want to give money to businesses and buy businesses than real good businesses to sell. It's probably like two point something trillion dollars is on the sideline just waiting for a good deal. Wow. But most businesses don't pass due diligence. So that's the hardest part. And so I would help him source deals. So my whole job when I wasn't with my nine to five and I wasn't with him was just meeting founders. Hey, would you want to sell? Would you want to sell? Doing the dirty work for him, showing him some deals. So I was a part of something where he bought something for seven million dollars. And then 27 months later, he exited for 27 mil. Wow. Netted 20 in 27 months. Wow. So I'm like, man, I could do this. I've been, I see all the players, I know all the moves. So I, uh, I made an offer to buy five different businesses, put an LOI out, letter of intent, and one uh, took my offer for three point thirteen What's point eight million. What's included in the LOI for somebody listening? So the LOI is like the price in, how much you're gonna buy it for, if it's gonna be like a stock sale or an asset sale. There's pros and cons of that. Basically, like a term sheet. A term sheet. Yep. How much you gonna buy it for? When you want to close? What needs to happen, et cetera. Okay. Got it. All right. Yep. So I did all that, came back to him, told him about it. I only had about 20K like, of my actual money committed to it. But from those books, you realize you really don't need money. And in that dinner, he committed to helping me rent. Uh, he committed to a million dollars towards the deal and to help me raise the rest. And I raised the whole entire mountain for uh, 40 days, 41 days. The, you raised the whole 13 million? 13.8 million in 40 days, 41 days. <laughs> Network, bro. Connects. You, you built the network over that time. That's it. What was you saying to them to get them to uh, invest though? One, it was a great deal and I understood yeah. what I was doing. 
Two, I was able to uh, attach the opportunity with his experience, right? So he came in with me, and so I borrowed along his experience and track record. And then really it was like, yo, I'm going to put in the work. It makes sense on all the ends. Even though it's my first time, I understand that's the weakness. I brought in people who's been doing it for decades, and it was just a good opportunity. Wow. That's crazy, bro. That's like, that's textbook of how to go do this thing. Man. That's literally it. Literally it. Bro, it just as you my wills is just turning about buying more businesses right now. Like it's just turning on just private equity is the way. That's it. When you look at like the wealthiest people in America, wealthiest black people, it's the abs method, ABS. That's what I that's what I subscribe to. Acquire assets in a business, right? Uh build up the value of the assets, sell, some or all of it. So when you look at like the Elon Musk, the the Jeff Bezos, right? Those guys sold their businesses by going public. Elon has exited PayPal and Tesla's a publicly traded company. When you look at the people in our space, it's like, all right, you make excuses. All right, well, you know, we're black, da 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 da, da. it's different. When you look at the Jay Z's, the Rihanna's, the people on the billionaire list, the um all of those guys, even though they're popular for entertainment, it's the title deals, buying and selling that. It's the it's the alcohol yeah, deals. Yeah. It's the And he never deals. he didn't start title. No. He didn't start uh, whatever alcohol no, he, he didn't got start right anything. Now. He just acquired interest in it, added value to it, right? Instead of going from zero to one, he took it from one to two, and then kicked it off to some guys who could take it from from there. That's it. It's a game. Wow. So tell me about so so this first deal done. Should we talk about the two fifty or something like that? Yeah, let's talk, part of the journey. Yeah. So tell me about Unsexy that sexy part. So I was on the show and I'm like, wait, he's bored a deal, then some bad stuff might have happened with some of these deals. Like, because I want people to understand what to look out for, right? So so share that. Yep. So that was valuable information. Um, so what happened was. I, I started slowing down on executing monies in a bank. So I done found all this money, negotiated terms. Uh, this company was in the oil and gas uh, space. They serviced like oil and gas companies. So a lot of it was on autopilot, long-term contracts, et cetera. I was supposed to send in all the final paperwork on like a Thursday uh, to get the wire to close the deal. And then uh, for the bank, but I didn't. Was dragging my feet on it. And I'm already thinking about the win, right? Mm -hmm. So I sent it in on Friday, but they had a half day on Friday. Yeah. So it rolled over to Monday's decision. No worries, everyone. Verbal agreement. Everything's everything's fine. Well, on Saturday, the price of oil went from $130 a barrel all the way down to 30. Wow. Monday morning, the bank president was like, "Hold up, I don't want nothing to do with oil and gas until we figure out what's going on." So they rescind it or they put everything on pause. Long story short, that spiraled down out of control, and I was stuck with all the transaction expenses, 240K. Wow. Sheesh. Legal expenses, accounting expenses, all the different things that would go into buying a $14 million company. Wow. Jeez. That's crazy, bro. So I was depressed for about two, three weeks, bro. Yeah, yeah. But in reality, that was a very expensive lesson. It taught me a lot of things. That was my first year as a full-time entrepreneur. Taught me a lot of things, and realistically, that prepared me to build and sell my business that we just uh, got acquired two years ago. So that was pennies on the dollar to the value of what it was worth, right? We were talking about the difference between value and cost. Yeah. Explain that, because people don't understand the difference between value and cost. A lot of people who look at things and investments wrong look at, man, that costs this. But I would gladly spend $100,000 to make a million. Mm -hmm. I'd come up with if I knew that it's increased my chances to go make, you know, 5X, 10X, whatever, I would bend over backwards to trying to find a way to do it. Yeah. And so that experience was pennies on the dollar to what I was, the value I was able to create for myself years after and what we were able to accomplish because we had over 200 people interested in buying our business when we sold. Nuts, that's not normal. And then from start to close, 28 days, money in the bank. Nuts, that's not normal. Yeah. But it was from all the mistakes I made that I knew I would never make again yeah. when I was on the other side of it. Wow. So you got this concept, and I've heard it before, about being exit ready. Yep. I want to talk, this for our brands, like, if you're a brand looking at this, I want you to know you could sell your company. Like, I, I want, like, one of my good friends, like, one of his biggest regrets, he didn't know this world of selling his company. His company was making 
three on a scale to three to ten million a year. Mm. And he just he just said, I'm done with this e-commerce business. He could have sold it, he said, probably for 30 million at the time, at the height of it. But he didn't even know it was a world of like we talk about it every that's his biggest regret. Right. And uh, shout out to Jabril. Jabril says discipline way ounces of regret weighs tons. Um, that was just a side note. But the idea is that, bro, like people don't even know you can go sell a business. But most people, I don't know if you got a percentage, but most people are not prepared to sell their business because nothing is in order or is stuff ain't whether the books ain't right. The you don't have no trademarks. Like it's just things that a company's not going to go buy your hair care brand and you had no trademarks, right? Yeah, they're probably not going to buy your brand if you have no social media assets, right? Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to Gillian them. I, I like prime example. They just told them the other day they were going into a new store. They got this energy drink called Pure. Shout out to Pure Energy Drink, right? Um, but in order for us to get in your store, and I'm, I'm thinking this could be a form of an exit, right? But you need to show us 50,000 followers on Instagram. So that is one form that they need to get in the store. But you're not somebody's probably not buying a business, uh, an e-com business or certain, if you have no social media presence at all. So that could be a requirement. So I want to hear through what are some things some business owners could, can be doing to prepare themselves to actually become exit ready. Yeah, you just dropped a lot like. A couple of points. So the first point is only 4% of businesses actually get sold. Wow. 4%. So 96% of businesses. What happened to that 96%? About, I think it's either weekly or monthly, about 10,000 businesses just close their doors. Yeah. For all the things you're saying, like they have different interests, a family event, death in the family, whatever, and they don't have a plan ready. And typically, if you don't have a plan ready... There is no plan, right? Mm, So nobody wants you, right? And so you just shut down. So a large percentage of that. And then the other percentage, about um, only 20, let me say it this way, 75% of businesses who want to sell don't because they're not prepared. So you look good on paper or on the outside looking in, but when someone makes an offer, gives you that LOI and peels back, looks at your stuff, it's like, "Mm, this ain't really a business. This is just a job for you. But it's not going to. I can't make money from it if I run it. This is only serving you because you're the face of it. Yeah. You know every how everything runs, et cetera. So they walk away from it. So that's one part. It's a big opportunity, especially for us, because the thing is the people who buy businesses are larger companies. Larger companies suck at being a founder. They don't know how to start. They just know how to take what you got and plug it into the system, the ecosystem they have. For example, uh, Amazon bought Whole Foods a while back and they overpaid, they paid about $13 billion. And for the average person, that was too much money. But what happens is Amazon knew they wanted to get into grocery delivery and it would have taken them years to figure out supply chain, set up locations, build out, build up a brand, vet all the thousands of vendors. They could just acquire Whole Foods and from day one be making money and then boom, plug it into their prime users. All of a sudden they got a new revenue stream and Amazon uh, grocery delivery. So that's the thing. They don't know how to start, but they know how to scale. So as a founder, our biggest asset is the stuff that you're talking about, like our community, building that up, having a tribe that rocks for you, Um, making sure your brand is transferable. Here's the thing I like to say. If um, we, we do a test, so we coach founders, obviously, on this stuff. So if day one you come in and you just shut off your phone and go on a surprise vacation for two weeks, would you still come back to a business? Yeah. Does your business depend on you, right? If you're not around, does the business still make revenue? Does this move forward? If not, you don't have a business. You just have a job. I got to stop the episode. I want you guys to stop what you're doing right now. Go to exitreadyblueprint.com right now, right? And what you're going to be able to do is you're literally going to be able to talk to Gamal or his team and see if you are exit ready. And more importantly, see what program will fit where you're currently at on your journey and how we can help you, right? Like literally, this guy has laid out the blueprint for your business to become exit ready. Some people, businesses are gonna close down when you can sell it. Some people, business right now, you can get five, 10 X of the EBITDA, right? Right now, but you have no awareness of this. So go to exitreadyblueprint.com right now so we can see how Gamal and their team can help. You're looking at deals, you're underwriting deals every day. What are some things that we need to be doing 
to really get ready? The most important things that people drop the ball on is one, the transferability part, right? Mm. The business depends too much on them. Yeah. On and the owner, right? On the owner, yeah. yep. And most businesses, I'm sorry to stop. You said leave for two weeks. Most businesses are crumbling. They done, bro. Yeah. Coming My back. man told me the other day, like 30 days. I said, no, nah, I don't think we're ready. We're almost there, but 30 days without me doing nothing. I'm like, yeah, it, it will work, but it won't work at the level that I really want it to work. So what happens is I work with a lot of e-com founders because that's my history. I've built and sold an e-com brand. And so naturally, even though it's very similar across all businesses, online business especially, we focus on e-com brands. So with e-com, what happens is a lot of the times the founder is the face of the brand to start. That's perfectly fine. You get a tribe behind you, tell your founder's story. A lot of people can relate to it. At some point, though, you got to transition out of that to enable your brand to continue to thrive without you. A lot of the pushback a lot of black owned brands get is when they sell, people are like, oh, man, they sold out. We didn't get that backlash because on day one, we had a one page plan to sell our business in three to five years. We mm. sold in four years. And so we worked backwards to intentionally do the things so that when we did, it wasn't a surprise. And so a lot of the founders need to eventually transition into having uh, other people who share as a face of the brand. Yeah. Um, and it's powerful right there. That Ooh. is so simple. Yeah. But just, you know, other people could show up and still get the same stuff, but you need to systemize. You need to systemize your launch process. If a lot of the sales is coming from your personal Instagram page, you need to start having other influences associated with the brand so that as you go mm. and sell your business, you don't have to sell your personal brand and your personal page with it because that's how the revenue is being generated. Yeah. You need to start pushing people down to your brand page to be able to do that. So the brand just needs to start standing on its own eventually, but it's perfectly fine to start with being the face of the brand. That's the number one problem yeah. for people who look like us trying to sell a business. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So shout out to my brother, Matt and Fabi. They started a company fit with Fabi. I think you know Matt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We were on our calls together. Mm -hmm. So he understands enterprise value and that like, we can't just continue to only build this on her. So they transitioned to Queen Warriors and, and slowly pulled her out where she's not just the cure, the, the main person that is pushing this. So it's, it's similar kind of 100%. what they did there. But let me ask you this because you said it's OK to start with a personal brand. Do you start the name from the rip, though, with something that is not ta tailored towards a personal brand? One hundred percent. So. Like I said, our, our one year plan, our one page plan was to get acquired. So we knew the name. It would be more difficult to change the name mid scale than to just start introducing some people. So we always had a name that was standalone by itself that could be exit ready. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. good. So start again. Essentially, what we're telling people to do is begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. That's Have my a favorite book, star. too. Yeah, that's Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Solid. Yeah. That's game, a game changer. changer. Book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So start there. So that's a big problem. The second part is um, what happens is as entrepreneurs, because we're, uh, when we show up, the business produces. So we would have high swings, like some months it'll be high six figures, other months it'll be 75K, whatever. I knew from the outside looking in, that looks like risk. So in entrepreneurs, we're born to take risk. Mm. So we see that and good, sleep good at night, right? $100,000 swings in our business each month. For an outside investor who's probably taken on a loan or probably uh, gathering investors to buy your business, swings don't look good. Because if they're gonna get a bank loan based on this amount, the bank's gonna look like, okay, well in three of the months out of the year, you're dropping below 100 grand, how are you gonna pay the loan then? Like what's gonna happen? So we're looking at risk as an opportunity. Buyers and investors don't like risk, so you got to mitigate them. So what we decided to do is to create a reoccurring re uh, revenue model mm. because that yeah. creates consistency. Mm -hmm. You don't really need ads or if the algorithm changes because, you know, I didn't spend over $3 million. And you on did ads. this with your with your e-com business. With e-com. Most with brands not even thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Talk, talk. That, that's a, like I'm happy because you're about to give somebody a brand to play that they can instantly go put in motion that's going to help them make some more money, increase their enterprise value 100%. because of the ARR and the MRR, which for those who don't know, it's annual recurring revenue and monthly recurring revenue. Yep. So like on that, and then back to the point, all revenue isn't equal. Yeah. So revenue that depends highly on like, it's another way of risk. If your business only depends on one thing, like Instagram account, what happens if that goes down? Because it does, all of a sudden the business is out. 
investors are gone too. If you depend too highly on ads, which we did early on, then we lost our ad account, almost put us out of business. Uh, investors are going to run. So you, they want to be diversified. So revenue from reoccurring revenue and multiple channels is way more valuable than revenue from one source. So that's one thing. Oh, and like big difference, like normal revenue is probably like three to five X reoccurring revenue is probably like 10 to 15 X, like huge difference. Mm. So we realized that even though I was good with ads and I managed like 3 million in ads spent, you know, hundreds of thousands in ads for our business yearly, the average person probably didn't have that comfort zone with that. So we started weaning our dependency on ads, starting to incorporate email and SMS. And then we dropped a subscription program and we got over 3000 people subscribed to that. And our Tell biggest customer, yeah. our biggest customer um, uh, bought 46 times from us. Wow. So when you went to a business now, typically the people with these check sizes, they're not, they don't look like us. They're trying to understand our culture and our demo. And they're like, man, there's a lot of risk with this business. I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to discount it and pay you X. We're like, no, you don't need to, because look, our, our most loyal customers, 46 times, we got 3000 people. Here's the estimated revenue is predictable. We only spent 25% of our, our, our revenue on ads. Here's the charts. By the way, I haven't showed up in an ad or on social media in months. Here's the other people who already said they're going to continue making content for us. There's no risk involved in this deal. It's all upside. Right. Ooh, let me, because I want to give them even, I want them to leave with this e-commerce brand right now. You said you had 3,000 people on recurring revenue. What was the product and how do I roll this out? I, and already, I want y'all to catch this. So diversify one do not depend on one sole thing whether it's ads whether it's organic never depend on one thing because what happens is something happens to the one thing immediately try to find a way to inject recurring income in your business because it increased your value 100 um much more and you said all income is not created equal all income is not created equal my biggest mistake g when i when i look back in business the 15 years in business then the seven years of just kind of what I do now, the biggest mistake was not focusing enough time, energy, and money on recurring revenue. Russell Brunson said, if you don't have recurring revenue, you don't have a business. At all. That's yeah. 100%. I even incorporate that now into my coaching program. Like a lot of this stuff is just fundamentals. It's not sexy, but it's, it's not going to be powerful, trending on Instagram. Bro. Yeah. But these are the things that's been around for decades, bro. Bro, what you just said is it's, it's gold. Like it's platinum, like it's if, if, if applied. So I want you to go, what was the product and how do right now do a brand go, am I sending out an email? Am I sending out a text? Am I, what am I doing to do my first layer of uh, recurring revenue? So the good thing is um, about when we hit that 18 month mark, we realized we we're gonna start having a family and we're like, all right, we gotta start really speeding up the exit process. And so um, I launched a program. Here's what you do. We sold grooming products for black men, uh, like kind of high value men of color. And the main thing that e-com brands get wrong is they think that they're selling a product. That's wrong. What you should be doing is building a community and just monetizing that relationship through a product. It's a small switch, but it makes a big deal on the value you could propose to your reoccurring revenue. So for us, our guys were um, corporate partners, entrepreneurs, et cetera paying hundred dollars for haircuts. The average price of beard oil and beard products at the time when we launched was like five to ten dollars. Procter and Gamble, a Procter and Gamble uh old exec told me that they could never sell a product to black men for eleven dollars or more. Like the ceiling was eleven. So we sold for twenty five and thirty just to prove them wrong. Mm. Because we're you're not gonna outdo a billion dollar company at their own game. You gotta play a different game. So we decided to go premium right? Back to the same difference between value and cost. We decided to go after men who understood value, not cost, and weren't, weren't cost-centered, and we sold this premium product. So for them, giving a discount wasn't going to do much because they're already pay, uh, appreciating value. So our biggest value drive wasn't save 5 or 10% on the product by subscribing. It was never run out of product because you need this to show up and, and look good on dates, present well at your presentations. It was join our exclusive membership club where we have these quarterly meetups of other high value guys too. We had a meetup where some dude just sold his business for 80 mil, some dude just made law partner. Like These are the meetups of the room. So it was invite only, only to our people. And mm -hmm. they wanted to be a part of that. One of the dudes who bought, shout out to Will Watkins, one of the dudes who bought 28 times, come to find out he didn't even have a beard. 
he was just a high value dude and was a part of the mission. And so he would wow. support, give it to his other people. And so that was the thing we understood about our community is like we weren't selling product. We we're building community. So mm -hmm. what things could be valuable to the people outside of a discount? Because sometimes discounting it wasn't attractive. And only that, if we were selling our brand to whoever and we're like, hey, this is a premium brand, why would the value prop be a discount? Because that's communicating something different. So our value prop was in line with who, the value we we're going to do and position when we sold. So back to, to close it all out, if you are a founder right now in e-com brand, the thing you need to do is figure out what can you sell to your brand, uh, to your people, to your community that's going to improve their life? How could you position your product as something that's going to help them in whatever area of their life? And then add that to the membership program. So it could be exclusive discounts on stuff. We have a founder who gives everyone in her membership program a week early access to her new drops because they always sell out. So that's a way for her to create loyalty and value. Uh, we have people who get in-person meetups as a part of being in the membership program. Just think outside the box and ways that you can add value to your audience outside of just giving them a 10, 20 percent discount because everyone's not in it for a discount. Bro, you just said something that's so powerful, bro. Just building community. Just as you were talking, I was thinking about this popped in my I'm like, yo, what if everybody has an e-commerce brand for the most part? And if you are not emailing and texting your customer, I want you to talk about how much money is being lost. If you're an e-com brand or any brand, I don't coach. I don't care what you do. If you are not emailing or texting your customers, you're leaving money on the table. Bro, I'm the I'm probably the biggest fan of doing the boring work. And that's it. Yeah. So fundamentals, right? Blocking and tackling. And just doing more of that. Yeah. So I like that. In our business. Fundamentals work though, bro. Work. They pay. So if you could picture this triangle, right? Like the bottom layer being foundations, the middle being strategy, and this one being like tips and tricks. A lot of what's being shared. So a triangle is like, like yep, and then you got and then three layers. Cut, got yep. It, yep. So foundation. I wish I could have this show up on the screen right now. Like, yep. So that's our e-commerce blueprint. So yeah. Triangle, yep. seven figure brand, it's mm. finances, operations, and yep. marketing at the bottom, right? Mm. Marketing is the foundation, but you can't grow without these other sides, yeah. right? And then That's within good. that is foundations, strategy, and tactics. A lot of what's being shared on social media is the tactics, like this new hack, something that works for three to six months, and then you got to come up with a new thing. It's reels this week, it's it's threads the other week. That stuff is, you know, you're going, you're going, you're always going to be behind trying to keep up. The foundation stuff is the boring work that nobody does. But you can double and triple your business just on this. So if you're an e-commerce brand, you can literally double your business without any additional ad spend just by increasing your conversion rate, your average order value, and how often someone buys by 30%. If you do each of those by 30%, you double your business. That don't have nothing to do with Instagram, nothing to do with Reels, nothing to do with TikTok. It's literally something you could go home and control. And so... Well, I say all that to say the foundation of a membership program is first having an offer that people enjoy and then literally just sending it out to your list, communicating the value, emailing and SMS and that. And then we had an ad funnel set up. So any any new cold traffic would go through our ad funnel. Any kind of reoccurring second, third purchase would all go through our membership funnel. Like if you wanted to buy again, you had to see the option to buy our membership program. Mm. And then we created a special portal just for that where it's only membership products. Like you couldn't even buy a one-time thing. It was only membership at first. Yeah. And then if you didn't buy, we would then introduce back the real, the one-time products. Powerful. We, every month we'll email, SMS our list. Wow. Did you know about our membership the program? The only way you even could buy initially is a member. That's it. That's so the, the first time you could buy a regular, just one off. You try the product, love it. We tell you all the value prop opportunities of the community would highlight the people in our community. Hey, did you just know Neo just sold his business for 80 mil to Goldman? Da, 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 da. He's a part of our membership program. We just teased it, right? 30 days. Okay. Product should be coming up for our, for a refill. Now we'd love to give you a special invite to our VIP program. You get products on repeat, but then you get all these other exclusive benefits. You could only buy something if it was signing up for a subscription for a while. And then after a while, if no one bit, then we're like, OK, back to the one off products. But that was why we were able to grow to over 3000 plus people in a short amount of time. And every month we ran ads, emails and SMS 
to get people to join our membership program. Hey, you're looking at this and you're probably enjoying this episode and the strategies and the gems that I give you. This is just a fraction of what you learn in my mastermind, right? I would love for you to be able to learn more information on how he's able to help Carter Cofield make a million dollars in one single day, how he's able to help Rochelle Parks make over $500,000 in a day, learn how he's able to help Tevin grow his Instagram following from 70,000 followers to upwards to 200,000 followers within two months. And again, those results are not typical let me be very clear but they are possible for those who are willing to put work in energy and effort if you're looking at this video right now i want you to go to the website mastermind with neo neo.com so you can apply to see if you're a good fit for a mastermind this is specifically for someone looking to grow their digital business right even though y'all probably even know David Shan, Sleepers for Suckers, he's inside of my mastermind. You probably know Sonya, the student loan doctor, he's inside of my mastermind. You probably know Darius Daniels, he's inside of my mastermind. Those are just a few more people who are absolutely crushing it as a result of being inside of the community. So listen, if you're looking at this, right, and you're probably looking at the episode like, man, you're dropping so much gems but can you imagine how many gyms you'll get when you're actually inside of the environment, when you're tapped into the community? What I want you guys to go to right now is mastermindwithneo.com so you do not miss out on your opportunity to get tapped in. You will have to apply, you will have to get on the call, and hopefully you make the cut to be a part of what we got. I'll see you on the inside. Let's get back to the episode. People in our space are used to one, one-off purchases. No one had an LTV of People buying forty six times. That's wild. Yeah, that's crazy. That's wild. Yeah. People Most buying times I'm thinking times three no to beard. four times. Forty Yeah, twenty eight times, times with no beard is wild. I don't know how you did that. It's the community, bro. Yeah, that's like, wild. The product is only one thing, but it's like being a part of this mission, being a part of this vision. One of my mentors told me that in order to build, like if you wanna if someone offers you a ride on a rocket ship, you don't ask for a seat, you just jump on. And so taking that same fundamental philosophy. Other people want to be an entrepreneur. Other people have dreams of launching a brand, but for whatever reason, they can't. So how can I create a vision for myself that also serves other people so that they want to come along for the ride too? So that's what we created. And so we built Fresh Heritage for us, but by extension, all of our customers too, and how they could support this mission that we're on by building a community of high value black men all over the world is by monetarily supporting us with our product, whether they use it or not. They just wanted to come along for the ride. Wow. And and what I was saying was, I think every e-commerce brand, bro, like you should start a monthly call with your group. 100%. Just a a, a meet and greet, a powwow. 100%. Man, like imagine if you got a hair loss community and you just bring them all in. Like a a, a weight loss community, you Man, that's it. Because like powerful. one of our founders, they sell hair products and um, they're an essential worker. They were an essential worker. So they're always out in the elements, you know, in their words, not mine. They, they can never stay sexy. They're all hair was always getting beat up, weather, sun, water, whatever. So they started wearing these certain type of hairstyles for that reason. So they could have their confidence throughout the day. Right. And she wasn't selling that, though. She was like trying to sell the product quality. And I'm like, nobody cares about that. Imagine how many of the women are going through this, just tell your story. So she became the face, attracted all these other women who could relate to her, right? Drivers, people outside, people in the elements, and then brought in other people to start sharing the message, took herself out the business. But all of a sudden she had a whole, like hundreds of thousands of people on her list who were supporting her. Probably some of them used the hair, but really they were supporting other people because they relate to them. That's such a valuable asset to a, a bigger company who can't, they couldn't spend 10, 20, 30 million dollars to attract people who had this brand loyalty. So that's it. All she did was have weekly, uh, monthly calls and monthly meetups to talk about the journey, how to stay confident, how to stay pretty, all this other stuff. And by the way, we got these products you could support, but it's really about serving. Yeah. And it turned into a multi million dollar thing. Wow. Man, Whew. this episode. This show got a lot of game, bro. I'm just thinking about just the game of recurring revenue we just gave them, just really preparing. Any other exit tips that you want to share that you think are important for people to just really think through? Because some people may not be ready right now, but they're going to get ready. Bring up a good point. So I'll, I'll answer that and then answer the second point. So the main point is exiting your business looks very different to different people. So it could be like what we did and sold the entire thing for a big payday. 
or it could look like setting it up and selling it to a partner. One of my friends built a business up to a point. He knew online direct to consumer, but didn't know retail. He ended up selling 30 something percent of his business to another partner. That partner got them into 4,000 Walmarts. How many ever Walmarts is, is in the world, in the nation? All the Walmarts in the nation. And he just worried about that part. So he split the brand. We'll do online, you do retail. And then combined, they built a much more valuable thing and they sold the business for 37 million. He wouldn't have been able to do that if he didn't have that first exit. So sometimes exiting could just be like, yo, Neo and Gamal, we got retail, but Neo and Gamal, we don't understand online. Here's 40% of this business, we, we help with this thing. And so sometimes splitting the pie, if not even 100%, could mean a more valuable thing. Oh, 100%. People be wanting to hold on to everything. And I've been victim of that sometimes. I ain't going to lie. But now it's like, if you could do this, I'm willing to give you a percent of this business. If you're going to go handle and manage, we not online on Amazon or on Walmart. Or on, hey, go take us online and let's break that bread up. Yep. So that's a big part. Exiting and also exiting. And that's something you do with businesses. That's something we do with businesses. Exit so. ready blueprint, y'all. Like all like from analyzing your business, seeing if it's ready to be sold, seeing if they're willing to partner with you. Of course, you got to qualify, but go go check that out because your business, you, do you only, what's the threshold of working with you? Is it a million? I know you help businesses. Break that down. Is it a threshold? For yeah. that partnership model? So the inflection point. So like we have we have two programs. We have one for like established programs, yeah. established established companies, yeah. high six, seven figures. And then we have something uh, for people just kind of starting off. Got it. And so if you're starting off, there's things you can do to make you more exit ready first. But really, you got to get to a certain inflection point where it makes sense. Inflection so, point, what that mean? Right. So like um, there are different parts in your business where sales, uh, your monthly sales or your annual sales, there's certain things that you can do. So let's say that under half a million dollars, there's not going to be a whole lot of room for people to invest and make money. But there are things you can do to get it up to that point where it increases value. And then from like that half a mil to like 1.5 part, there are things you can do and there are people who are interested to have that kind of money to be able to invest in that business. So there are certain things you do to make it more valuable there. Yeah. And then once you pass that, then there's different buyers who care about different things. So based on where you are in your sales process, there are things that are important. So like the things that you're doing at five million a year in sales, you shouldn't even worry about it like half a million in sales is mm. essentially what that means. Mm. And so on our website, um, and I'll, I'll give you the info about our stuff if you're whatever stage, if you're not ready to exit, but we have two tracks. Got it. Kind of getting started in like exit track. Okay. Yeah. So we'll make sure y'all get all of that. But bro, this has been enlightful. few questions before we wrap out, wrap up. Three of number one recommend the business books or books that you like um dang that's a good one uh why should white guys have all the fun if we're talking about anything interesting right now um and you know i really like atomic habits because mm -hmm. how you do everything how you do anything is how you do everything yeah and a lot of business is really just personal stuff carrying over and so developing habits just compounds yeah. what you can do in business those are my two ones right now. Okay. And then advertising, scientific advertising yeah. is, a, is, a, is a solid one because if you understand how people make buying decisions, you could use that to grow your business a little bit faster. It's good. Two, three people you look up to, um, like in the, uh, whether it's Bezos, is there anybody that you model that you would love to be like, yo, I would love to have dinner or, you know, they say dinner with Jay Z or 500,000. Like, who's that person that you want to do dinner with? So hope for Two sure, people. hope for oh. sure. I, I, I've been a big fan of his music and now his business acumen. Yeah. Um, so I love what he's doing. And then um, there's so many, bro. There's, a, you know, the podcast, My First Million. I heard about it. I don't know about you. I like I like what those two guys, Sam and Sean, I like what they're doing a lot. And this guy named Naval, he's like a he's like a behind the scenes dude on Twitter dropping a bunch of games. So all the people have built and sold businesses. And they're years ahead of me. So I just want to speed up my learning curve. That's good, bro. So, y'all, with that being said, man, another show that told you we're going to keep bringing you more and more fire and more and more heat to help you grow your brand. Um, this show was brought to you by New Age CEOs, y'all. So make sure y'all get uh, the number one brand when it comes to entrepreneur wear, right? We're not rappers. We're not athletes. we entrepreneurs. 
Um, and um, we can't wait to see you on the next show. Um, and Gamal, let them know where they can find you on social and all of those things. And we'll drop every link that you, that you have so people could tap in. Yeah, I'm easy to find on Instagram at Gamal Codner. The website to learn about all my programs and what we do is codner.co, where we could talk about the ecom blueprint. And then Neo and I are working up something special, super yeah, special super for special. you guys. Exit ready blueprint. Yeah, exit ready yeah. blueprint. So if you're watching, wait. if you're watching this and anything resonated with you, we gave you enough to go run with it. But if you want the step by step, the hand holding, yeah. and what I learned from David working for two and a half years for a fraction of the cost, <laughs> all right? Fact. Uh, check out my exit blueprint. Yeah. Right. Powerful. Yep. Yep. And then uh, anytime, anything before that, check me out at codner.co or Gamal Codner on Instagram. Let's get it, y'all. We'll see you guys on the next show. Peace.